Haiti has experienced decades of political turmoil. With frequent changes in government, this instability created a power vacuum that gangs exploited to gain control of the main cities. I speak to Robert Fatone. He's a professor of government and foreign affairs at the University of Virginia. I met Fatone at our offices in Washington, D.C. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background and what sparked your interest in politics in Haiti? I was born in Haiti. I was born in Paul class a long time ago. And I've been always interested in, ha in Haiti's history and politics. And uh, by the late 90s, I was writing a lot about the country. Uh, so the interest is because I'm part of that country. And I feel very deeply about the issues concerning Haiti. And uh, Haiti has been uh, really a rather tragic history in the last at least 80 years. And the order in Haiti started to fall apart, not terribly in the 90s, but when Aristide came back to power in 2000, uh, things really began to fall apart. Uh, there were elections and there, were, there was fraud. Uh, Aristide was elected, he was clearly the dominant figure, but the legislative elections were fraudulent. And that led to another, essentially, coup against Aristide, who left the country in 2004. Uh, and since then, it's been down, down, down. It's not just politics, it's also, essentially, nature was against Haiti. We had a series right. of hurricanes right. and a horrible uh, earthquake that destroyed much of the infrastructure of Paul Press and uh, the, uh, you know, around Paul Press. And Paul Press is really the hub. If Paul Press is destroyed, the country is really in crippled deep, in yeah, essentially. Faton is professor of government and foreign affairs in the Department of Politics at the University of Virginia. He's the author of several books, including Haiti, Trapped in the Outer Periphery. Can you talk about having that perspective grounded in your study versus what we see from people from the outside who think they know exactly how to fix Haiti? Well, I think if you read, for instance, the Western press, Haiti is a caricature. It's essentially a country that is falling apart, and it is. But on the other hand, it is a country which is falling apart not only because of its own institution and its own ruling classes, but also because of massive foreign interference. And foreign interference in Haiti just does not get it. I don't know if it's malicious or not, but it doesn't get it. You can't go to a very poor country and rely on the people at the top who do the same thing over and over again and assume that you're going to get a different result. It's going to lead to the kind of situation that we have right now. So I think there is kind of a, a disconnect between what uh, foreign powers want to do in Haiti and what Haitians, the vast majority of Haitians, would like to have in Haiti. The elite is very much at ease with foreign powers. I mean, they are in collusion, literally. Uh, and you can see that with the different governments that we have, mainly actually the, the last two prime ministers were basically choices made by the international community. And not the people of Haiti. So there is that kind of disconnect. There's also a cultural disconnect. Haiti is a complicated country, like all countries, but not more complicated than other countries. So you need to understand the culture, which is deeply African at one level, but increasingly connected to the United States. I mean, the diaspora in the United States is absolutely vital for the survival of Haiti. I mean, it's about $3 billion are sent back by the diaspora, which is much more than foreign assistance. But they're also disconnected. And I know that because I've taught many of Haitian Americans, they don't speak Creole. They have a very vague idea of Haiti, you know, first black country that rose uh, from slavery. To, and all of that is very nice, but they, they don't understand the country. They, they haven't been back. So you have that disconnect. And then there is the vision of Haiti as a weird place with voodoo, et cetera, et cetera. 
And voodoo is a complicated religion, but it's like any other religion, which is peculiar side and like, like any religion, yeah. basically. Yeah. So, uh, but there is a fundamental disconnect between what should be done, I think, for Haiti and what is being done uh, for Haiti. Marginalized communities, particularly in urban slums, often lack access to basic services, education, and economic opportunities. Gangs can provide a sense of community, protection, and financial support. Well, I can't think of a country uh, where you have a former police officer with a nickname Barbecue uh, suddenly runs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Can you talk about that? And also the, the gang violence, what's fueling that? And how do you put the skids on that? Well, the gang violence is the result essentially of the decay of normal politics, if you want to call it that way. So all political parties by, I would say, the mid-90s started to organize their own gangs. You know, whether it was, was the government, the p people in the opposition, the business sector, etc. You couldn't settle political differences in a political way. So you needed to use force. So you would compel certain things by using the gangs. Now, what happened, I think, after uh, 2004 and the fall of Aristide then, is that the whole thing exploded. And Minusta came, started to put a brick on the gang, but not fully. And the condition of the gangs is something that I think we need to understand as a manifestation of the inequities that you have in Haiti. I mean, most of the people in the gangs are poor people, and they are young people. Haiti is a very young population. So those people have nothing to lose. And when you give them a gun, they feel like, I'm a man now, and I'm going to assert my power. It's a disaster, but nonetheless, there is that kind of uh, uh, vision of things in the slums. Most of the people are from the slums. Uh, and then the gangs were nurtured by the elites, but the gangs started to coalesce into forces of their own. In other words, we are no longer going to receive all the orders from the elite. There are still connections. It's, I mean, everyone knows that even if they deny it but they have autonomy. Now, what is happening now? I don't know how you're going to stop that. Uh, you may stop it by using violence. You may have some negotiations. It's very difficult to tell. And it's not clear at all that the mission that has been set, it just was started to being built with the Kenyan officers. It's only 200 uh, people. I don't think that is enough. But I, I, I can't understand the, the notion of barbecue. I mean, Creole is a very interesting language. And barbecue is not just because of what he's doing in terms of the crime. So it's also because he was the son of a woman who was selling, you know, in the streets of Paul Press, so, some meat which has barbecue. So he's the son, so he's barbecue. And now is really barbecue. <laughs> and he was a police officer. I know. Trained by, you know, this supposedly rational police officer. Right. And where, where is he? I saw uh, there was an interview recently with the interim prime minister who you've referred mm -hmm. to, Gary Coneal. Um, and he became very emotional in this interview. And I've got a quote, and I, and I want to mm -hmm. give you thoughts on this. He said, it's been quite unfair that for decades the Haitian people have not had leadership that reflects their courage their generosity, and their capacity for change and hard work. Can you talk about that? And I mean, is it good that at least he recognizes that the poor people of Haiti are having to suffer through all of this? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's obvious. I mean, you fly to Paul Press, there's no way that anyone who has some humanity can't see that there is a real problem between the elite and the vast majority. And I come from the elite. And I know what the elite thinks, and it's quite ugly. I mean, they are proto-fascist, put it, to put it bluntly. Uh, the vast majority of Haitians have struggled for most of the history of Haiti, but more so in the last 40 years. But there is courage. I mean, Haitians that did with under Francois Duvalier, Jean-Claude Duvalier, they removed Jean-Claude Duvalier, and I was talking about the euphoria. That was a popular movement. And it was crushed again. 
you know. So there is that tragedy that trying to recognize the inequities of Haiti is a very dangerous business in a society that is so polarized. And the people who have power, small elite, and they don't want fundamental change. And I'm not sure that the foreign community wants fundamental change because you can look at the programs. I mean, you can start a program and look at what it does. And you, see, and you can clearly see it doesn't work. The, the country can't feed itself. Agriculture has been destroyed and has been destroyed essentially by foreign policy because you, the economy is completely open. Rice, sugar, all of those things are disappearing from the capacity of Haitian uh, farmers. And that has been a tragedy too because the, the peasantry sees that their livelihood uh, is collapsing. So they move to the cities. And in the cities, there are no jobs either. So you go to the slums and you have, I mean, it, it, we don't even know the exact population of Haiti. We haven't had a good census in years. So you go to, to Paul Press, the slums are all, I mean, they're everywhere now because people have been marginalized economically, politically, morally. There is that reality. Haiti's geographic location makes it a key transit point for drug trafficking between South America and the United States. Gangs are heavily involved in this illicit trade, which provides them with significant financial resources and power. Is that what we're going to continue to see? I mean, what needs to happen there? I think you need fundamental, when I say fundamental, I'm not even talking about a radical change, but there are certain things that could happen progressively. For instance, you could prioritize food production in Haiti, but that goes against commercial interests because they're in the business of importing and selling. That goes against the policies also of opening up the economy. But I don't think that is such a big demand to say, let's concentrate on agriculture, let's try to get food production going. Let's create some uh, infrastructure in the countryside, irrigation, you know, electricity in the countryside. That to me is, there's nothing very radical about it, but it seems that the people who are in charge or have been in charge, that is not the plan. Uh, and the only thing that w we've been told to do from by the foreign community and the Haitian elite is to have those small industries to export. That didn't work because there was no real transformation in education. There was no real transformation in the agricultural sector, etc. So some reforms in that sector, concentration on human capital, uh, as I've said, agriculture, uh, the infrastructure itself, irrigation, electricity, those kind of things that would really slowly began to change Haiti. But the other problem is that there is not much time because the population is demanding change. And the reality is Haiti does not have the resources and it takes time to build on infrastructure to recreate an agricultural sector. People are expecting that very quickly the gangs will be out. And that is not going to happen very quickly. Limited access to quality education and vocational training leaves many young Haitians with few opportunities for upward mobility. In response, gangs often fill this void by providing an alternative path. How does Haiti compare with other countries there in terms of what, what yeah. is going through? What is fascinating is that if you look at the Dominican Republic and Haiti in the 1950s, Haiti was ahead economically and in terms of tourism, etc. I was in the Dominican Republic a few years ago. It's a I mean, it's as if you are in two different universes. They even have a metro system. I mean, <laughs> this tree compared to Haiti is very sad. And the tourist industry has boomed. It's a really massive industry. You have airports in different parts of the Dominican Republic. We don't have that in Haiti. So there are certain things that we could learn from the Dominican Republic, but we have very tense relations with the Dominican Republic historically, etc. So I'm not sure what is going to happen 
Yeah, I'm, as you can understand, I'm rather pessimistic. But on the other hand, I realized that Haitians have managed to survive in very desperate conditions, so maybe something will change. Widespread human rights abuses, including extrajudicial killings, kidnappings, and violence against civilians are symptoms of gang violence. These abuses have displaced hundreds of Haitians and further eroded public trust in authorities. Are there things that give you hope that make you think perhaps even if it's incremental, you'll see steps going in the right direction. There are grassroots organizations in the countryside, even in Port Prince, that offer some hope. I mean, for instance, with the gangs, you've had uh, what is called the Bois Calais phenomenon. In other words, people in particular neighborhoods getting together to stop the advance of the gangs. Now, there's a danger also with that because it becomes violence. And if you have friends that you don't like or dislike now, you, you may accuse them of being part of the gangs. But in general, there was a mobilization at the neighborhood level, and they were organizing opposition, building, you know, walls, things of that sort. And when a gang would appear, everyone would know and you would take the necessary uh, precaution and you would also attack them. So there is that kind of thing. There's also uh, some NGOs, local NGOs in the countryside trying to do something about agricultural production, etc. And there, you know, there have been constant moments of popular demands. I mean, even under the former president, Jovenel Moise, you had a massive popular movement asking him to step down because he was accused of both things. But there was that grassroots movement. So that could happen again, and it could change things. Uh, but it's, it's not quite visible. But those things tend to appear suddenly, and you didn't realize that they were there. It's very much like the fall of Jacques-Claude Duvalier. I mean, it was a massive popular movement. At that time, the church was very instrumental in that change. There was the so-called Tille Eglise, the small church which was basically grounded in the so-called theology of liberation, you know, the priority to the poor, etc. And that had a hold on the population. The problem is that when Aristide fell the first time, there was resistance against uh, the military. But the second time, Aristide was not as popular, and there is some sort of cynicism. In other words, we were fooled so many times, what are we supposed to do? Uh, but again, this is a new generation. The vast majority of Haitians are under 19. So you're talking about the population that doesn't have that important memory, but they still organize and uh, they survive. I mean, for instance, the, as a result of the gang violence, you have something like over 300,000 people who've been displaced uh, into Paul Press, and they're organizing, but it's a very difficult job, but they are organizing to give some sort of semblance of normalcy, feeding people, etc. So not everything is bleak, but the forces in contention are still very much unequal. You say not everything's bleak. And I, this is going to be my final question. You've got an international community that's meddling. You've got gang violence. Uh, you've got policies that don't work for the economy. I mean, you've, you've kind of outlined everything. And, and you stack it all together, and really what you've constructed is a recipe for disaster. Is there one piece of that or two pieces, once they're removed, you can actually start to see things improve? Well, the first thing is obviously reestablishing a semblance of order and security for the vast majority of Haitians. Uh, and it, but I have to qualify that to most of the violence is in progress. But Paul Prince, as I've said initially, was is the hub. So if things go wrong in Paul Prince, the whole country feels it. So that's the first thing. How do you establish a modicum of safety for people so they can go back to, to their previous habitat, as it were? Uh, that will be the first thing. But then you have to deal with the issues that have created the gangs and created that violence. And this is where it's extremely difficult because you need to deal with issues of equity. 
we need to deal with issues of uh, jobs. I mean, I mean, those people need jobs. You need education for the population, etc. So that's the second step. The first step is difficult, but not impossible. It's the second step, and it has to start essentially while we are reestablishing safety. If you don't do that, we are back, as it were, to the future. It's not going to change. So you need to really address that issue. Otherwise, uh, you, you're going to get a new crisis. The same issues are going to, to reemerge. So the country has to decide that enough is enough, that we are going to change path. And hopefully this time, because the crisis is probably the worst in modern Haitian history, that people will realize that we need some form of compromise. We need to change our ways. That's my hope. Whether that's going to happen or not, I don't know. Well, we'd like to have you back on the show when it does happen. Well, I hope, we'll keep our I hope to crossed. be back. Then. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank Robert, you very much. So much. Thank you.